You want to play a game? <laughs> Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Podcast Daily. It is Tuesday, and uh, it's Trivia Tuesday. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. There, it's the easiest trivia game that you're ever going to play, I promise you. But I was just flipping through the PFF advanced stats like I always do. Like you do. Yeah, that's what you to- do. Totally normal thing. <laughs> I was just like perusing through. I was wondering if there'd be anything that just jumped out to me as I don't know, unusual or unexpected or better than I think people give give a player credit for. And um, I think I should probably do that more often. That's probably why you do it. I spend uh, way too much time just clicking around PFF, yeah. I mean, and so usual caveats. It's PFF. It's not perfect. They don't have access to everything for assignments and what the coaches are going to be putting down as what they're sp- the players are supposed to actually execute. So they're not flawless. We always say to take them with a grain of salt. Some things that are raw counting, they work a little bit. And I was digging into the stops, defensive stops, Bill. Good stuff. And uh, number four in the country amongst interior defensive linemen. So, again, some of these are pretty obvious answers. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I was learning more about the way that PFF was counting these stops. Tyleek Williams had, well, I just gave you the answer. He had 33. I knew that answer. Yeah. I knew that one. I've used fourth, that one several times. Fourth in the yeah. country. Like we, we talk about him a lot and the way that he surged a year ago. But it, it's, if it doesn't always show up in maybe directly tackles for losses or the passes defended, batted down, we know those. But just like handling responsibility on a play-in, play-out basis, that number really surprised me. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually know. PFF, I don't think, explains what a stop is. Thoroughly enough, it's like a, a play that negates a failure for the offense, but I think a failure can be like it's second and eight and we only gain two yards mm-hmm. kind of thing. So I think it's just like plays around the line of scrimmage, not necessarily at or behind the line of scrimmage. Um, but yeah, Tyleek was great at it last year. That, that was probably the, I don't know, it was the biggest difference. I don't know if I'd call it an improvement, but it was, it was a stark difference, I thought, from the previous year to last year how much the defensive tackles made plays. And Tyleek was obviously the guy who was, who was spearheading all that. And, and honestly, I think it led to a little bit of difficulty like evaluating the linebackers because their counting stats were lower because guys weren't getting to them. So um, I, I don't know if that was a byproduct of like schematical stuff that Jim Knowles and Larry Johnson had decided they wanted to do or more just about the skill sets of guys like Tyleek and, and Ty Hamilton and, Mike Hall, but it made a pretty big difference, I thought, for for Ohio State's defense last year. Just like it felt most weeks, it was like pretty difficult for offenses to kind of just like get out of first gear against them, or or hit big running plays because the defensive tackles were so good at like disengaging from blocks and making the plays themselves and just freeing up everybody else on the back end of the defense to kind of do some different stuff that that obviously impacts um, what the other team is going to do. So that'll that'll be a big part of of their success this year, I think. Like the more it's it's obvious, right? Like the, the more you can just sort of let your the, the, the defensive line cook, the more exotic or disguising or whatever you can do do on the back end. So I'm excited to see what that looks like this year. But yeah, Tyleek was very good at it last year. <clears throat> Some of those other numbers I just didn't understand because it would go further and be like, oh, stop percentage. And it was like your total number of snaps and the opportunities you had. And like, Tyleek's was pretty good. I'm like, I don't really know. It's 14%. And Ty Hamilton was up in that, that range as well. Mm-hmm. My call was very high. It's like, it proved that Ohio State's defensive tackles played at a pretty high level, and I think maybe Tyleek Williams didn't need that specific call out from us. But I, I like being number four at the country, in the country at anything is very good. Probably could have used something for Ty Hamilton to, Ty Hamilton to underscore his value to Ohio State because it, it, we've talked throughout spring and into the summer about where we think the depth is of that defensive tackle group and why we think that the loss of Mike Hall, though he is you know an NFL player now and and very good why Ohio State could be, I don't know, deeper, maybe not purest high upside. My call, I think, the measurables would be the best on that group. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, why there's confidence that this group could be even better maybe than a year ago. And I, I Ty Hamilton probably needed something more specific for me on a, to dig those numbers up. But it's like Ty Leaks are so good that I just couldn't. Couldn't turn away. Yeah, Ty, Ty Leak is definitely like a more of a stat producer. T- Ty Hamilton is like you can't quantify necessarily just sort of like being solid and reliable. Like I, I don't I don't know what what that number is. Um, 
that you would point to. I, I, I think he is a guy who, like, when I look at that stuff, like, I make note of the grades. Right? The, the grades are the thing you take with the biggest grain of salt from PFF because – You'll find guys whose grades look terrible, but then like, oh, no, I watched him play, and he was a good player, or vice <laughs> versa. Um, but Ty Hamilton's um, have always been really, really consistent, right? Like never never maxing out to the level where like maybe he's the highest graded defensive tackle, although I'm sure there are games where that's been the case. But you just don't see a lot of ebbs and flows with him. It's just like, yep, another here's another 75 grade from, from Ty Hamilton, <laughs> which is like a good grade on, on, on PFF. Yep. And he just sort of does it game after game after game while not necessarily like jumping off the television screen at you, but – that's part of the job, right? The part part of the the life of a defensive tackle is uh, doing things that people don't notice, just like eating up space, eating up blocks, and letting other guys uh, maybe produce. But um, Ty Hamilton does that very well, and probably about as well as I've seen um, from an Ohio State defensive tackle. So PFF called this sort of a uh, proprietary formula, and I don't know how much time you've spent on pass protection efficiency, Bill. What it? What would you? If you cut to the bottom of it, what do you think? Because like, the numbers don't make sense to me. <laughs> I'd like to know more about the the uh, blends and spices of KFC. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would assume that's some combination like pressures allowed and then how many, what percentage of those pressures become sacks. Yeah, I think it's probably it. I don't know. I, I wonder if it somehow takes into account or tries to account for whether or not the sack was the quarterback's fault or the offensive line's fault. like Because I, I, we don't talk about it enough, and this isn't just me like defending offensive linemen again, but sometimes a sack is the quarterback's fault. Right? <laughs> it's not it's like, yes, an offensive lineman has to get beaten for the quarterback to get sacked, but like if an offensive lineman holds his block for three seconds and the quarterback still has the ball in his hands, like that's not necessarily the offensive lineman's fault. So um, I don't know if that tries to account for that or not, but, yeah, it's a little bit of a nebulous number. Yeah, it seems like it does attempt to do that. And because you can see it, I, as I was scrolling through and I was putting it in, like the top twenty-five tackles in the country, playing four hundred snaps or more. And Ohio State had two of those. So again, trivia Tuesday is not that complicated. It's going to be one or the other. <laughs> and we have talked a lot about one one number that supports the case of someone who played on the right side last year, and then number twenty-three in the country in this metric for pass protection efficiency was Josh Simmons. Josh Simmons was pretty good last year. Like the the more I've sort of just kind of digested everything he put on the field last year, and I I, I want to actually go back and watch some of it because I haven't watched all that much of it. Just like looking at some numbers and comparing them what he was at San Diego State, he was a he was a vastly improved player from San Diego State, and probably I don't know, probably fairly like labeled as an above average Big Ten offensive lineman last year, but there was a chance that that was going to be an absolute disaster based off how he played at San Diego State. But he was, like, pretty good. And and I think it, you th- you take that into account and then you get encouraged by maybe what he, what he could be this year. Like, he, he wasn't, to me, a guy who, like, routinely kind of like got his butt whipped in pass protection, right? He had penalties, fewer, far fewer than what he had at San Diego State, but still probably too many for a place like Ohio State and some some killer ones, definitely. Um but I thought he had a good year, like and, and and the kind of year where if Josh Fryer kind of like tailed off a little bit at the end, it felt like Josh Simmons like kept getting better almost week after week after week. So um, I'm slightly surprised to hear that he was that high still, but I do think it tracks with what I saw with my eyes last year. I thought I thought he had a nice season. Yeah, I think if I had to guess based on the way the research that I was trying to do to figure out what this number meant, which was 98.1 for Josh Simmons, it probably is separating in a way that's not uh, fair for a comprehensive evaluation. It was probably not counting in any penalties. This was like, sure. all right, yeah. if if you didn't fall start and what happened after that, that was going to be pretty good for him. Now, if I, I think maybe the no, any notion that's out there, if there are if there are people that are still skeptical of Josh Simmons, which I which I know that there are because we get comments about it, and when the portal was open, it's like, well, they can't do any better than this guy at left tackle, like. Ohio State was in a pretty good spot there. They were open to something different on the right side if it was out there, which didn't materialize. But no real part of it from the Woody Hayes Athletics room was like, no, Josh Simmons isn't good enough. I think there's a very high confidence level. I I think he delivered on the potential they saw in him last year, or, or at least did enough last year to think that they were on the right track with him. 
And I know, like, a burn thinks Josh Simmons is going to be in the NFL after this year. Like, he doesn't have to. So, for me, like, I get really excited about the prospect of, like, is this guy going to be here for three years? Because that third year, he could be, I don't know, the best tackle in the Big Ten maybe. I, I don't want to put too much on him. But he, he has he has athletic upside, I think, to be a pretty impactful player. Um, and I guess I credit Ohio State for seeing that and taking a guy when he was kind of flying under the radar a, a, a little bit. And I think some of that right, was – the athletic profile that Justin Fry saw in him when he was in high school and, and I think camped at UCLA maybe, or, or at least Justin Fry got to see him mm-hmm. um, before recruiting kind of got shut down from that particular recruiting class. So to, like, commit that to memory and then remember, like, oh, yeah, this guy's got some upside. Like, I, I think it probably worked out for them. Like, um, it was a little up and down for sure. But I, even, like, the penalties, like, I, I haven't actually tallied up to see what they were, but I, I think they're mostly, like, still false starts and – Maybe like some hands to the face stuff on run plays. It wasn't like, oh no, I got beat. Let me go grab this guy and pull him to the ground kind of thing. So I, I thought he more than handled his own last year, and I'm fully expecting him to take a, a nice step this year. And I, and I believe, I could be wrong on this, but I, I I did look it up not that long ago. Um, some of the places that do like all portal teams, none of them had Josh Simmons as the, really as one of the two tackles. But I think if you like look at the PFF output for guys who transferred to and started as power five tackles last year. I think he was like in the top five, um, like grades wise. So he had, he had a pretty good season. Yeah. His grades were much better than I anticipated. And that was still like going into it with the knowledge that Ohio state thought pretty highly of the way he performed and got better throughout the year. Actually, when I looked at that, I was looking solely at tackles. Donovan Jackson's what a pass protection efficiency number was the highest for Ohio State. And I, I will admit that I, that that did kind of surprise me a little bit. But, mm. again, I think maybe I was guilty of the same thing that I point out about Josh Fryer. That's like I maybe held a few mistakes against Donovan Jackson against him and ignored the larger body of work. I think there are – I don't know if it's a trait of, of those particular players or not, but it does seem like when Josh Fryer and when Donovan Jackson make mistakes, they're like – the biggest blunders you've ever seen, or at least it feels that way. It's just like, well, the quarterback got absolutely crushed on that play because that guy missed the block. When it's like, yes, that happened, but it happened like twice within the course of the entire season, but you, you, you still tend to remember those two plays. So this is a weird one. They're all weird. I, yeah. I was looking at PFF numbers, so the whole show is weird. The whole premise is weird. But for this is skill position player, and it's an offensive player. Mm-hmm. For their position grades... Who was Ohio State's best performing player, according to PFF grades? Is this just receivers and backs, or does it include tight ends? It's just receivers and backs. Um, oh, that's a good question. Maybe uh, the Heisman Trophy finalist is second. Yeah. Xavier Johnson? It was Travion Henderson. Okay, okay. And the, well, I say, well, that makes a lot of sense. He's a very good player. He's one of the best yeah. returning running backs in the country. I would, would not have guessed that that would be the case. He beat Marv by like a tenth of one point. His overall offensive grade was a 90, and Marv was 89.9. PFF didn't like Marv for some reason last year. I don't, I don't really understand that. Uh, can't, can't get to the bottom of that. I'm not really sure. The only thing that hurt him, which, which was interesting, and again, like I'm, I'm just learning so much, Travion was a 68.3 in a run block grade, which... Um, when did that happen? Who cares? And <laughs> and when? I yeah. don't. I and why? I don't know. It, blo- blocking for whom? Because like <laughs> everything else, he was ninety and above. And like I was looking at the top ten backs in the country, and it's like, yeah, Trey's better here, better here. And he he got dinged for that. Which I guess if they're gonna do wing T and quarterback run, there may be situations where he has to do that. But I his suppose. but his like pass protection blocking was incredibly high. He got he got much better at that I think that was an area where I thought he struggled kind of mightily early in his career which is probably true of most backs and, and even more so of guys who are a little uh, on the smaller side I guess which I, I would I would characterize Travion as that but he's gotten much better at that um, I thought last year too he was and I think it was just a, a byproduct of like finally being healthy right the thing you want to see him do is is force missed tackles and then have a nice um, like yards after contact number and. I think personally, it could have still been better, only because it was really good his freshman year. Like it was really good for the first half of his freshman year, mm-hmm. um, which just shows you what the ceiling is. But it was definitely better than the year before. 
um, especially in the back half of, of last season. And like, that's the stuff that makes trivia on trivia. So that, that was good to see. Um, I'm not, I, I guess I was wrong on my guess, but I'm not surprised to hear that he was the highest graded skill player because when he was on the field, he was arguably the most impactful player in the high state's offense. Xavier Johnson's grades were high across the board. And I think maybe the snap count I used could have ruled him out. Oh, it, it was a pretty yeah. high, it was a pretty high one. Uh, so you could be right. I'd have to go change, adjust the sliders on the custom grades there. But he, because I was seeing a lot of things that were like, Xavier Johnson, not not so easy to replace for what he gave Ohio State last year. He's just an excellent, excellent football player, which is like again a thing that's like hard to quantify at times, but you know it when you see it. And if a guy like plays special teams as well as he did, plays receiver and running back as well as he did, and by the way, he was once a defensive back too, and <laughs> I think fairly well thought of when he was when he was doing that stuff. It's just like he he knows how to play the game, and that's why I think he's going to be in the NFL for a fairly long time for a guy who was not a scholarship player when he first got to Ohio State. If he wants to be, like I don't know if yeah. that's what he wants to pursue in his life or not, but he strikes me as someone that people will find space for on their roster because he can just do so many things for you. So I think like the question as well, Austin, did you really need? On some sort of metric from PFF to know that Travion Henderson is good at football, and the answer to that is no. But <laughs> we have, I have spent a lot of time like think, talking about Quinshawn Judkins and his pecking order amongst the national running backs, and just it does feel like maybe for me that it, and maybe some people feel the same. Like Travion is a bit like taken for granted that his decision to come back that it's not just well Ohio State has Quinshawn Judkins and he's going to be the primary guy. Uh, again, I don't, I'm not saying that everyone feels that way, but he, his decision and what he provided when healthy, it may not be getting enough attention nationally, and even I'm including myself in that. I think that that's probably right. Um, I do. I guess it's just the the natural reaction to a guy that's as high profile as Quinshawn transferring, and you sort of get um, not cast aside, but almost forgotten because like all Travion did was stick at Ohio state. He'll be a really <laughs> good player at Ohio state, but um, he does, he does seem to get glossed over a little bit. Like, and, and I think it probably will work out that Quinchon has more carries than him only because Quinchon is like a bigger, more durable guy and probably should have more carries than him. But I don't know that Quinchon will have more rushing yards. I don't know that Quinchon will have more rushing touchdowns. Um, I think Travion probably have more receptions than, than Quinchon Judkins has. So I, I think it's like the perfect complement of, of two backs that Ohio state has here. It doesn't really matter to me which one of them ends up with more carries. I'm, I'm more interested in like how they decide to use them, if they use them together at all. Because um, I just think they're both going to be very good in this offense. That's why, again, I think Ohio State's going to be one of the better rushing teams in the country. Um, not because, not merely because of the arrival of Chip Kelly, but because they have, talent-wise, like obviously like two of the top I don't know, eight running backs in the sport right now. It's crazy. I think I should have made this more difficult for you. You you already know all these numbers. I pl- I again I, I spent too much time looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. I do I know a decent amount about, about this teams and this team and where they stand PFF wise. Right. Yeah. Well it's maybe, rather it's rather sad. Maybe next time I'll have to do all the ones that are the areas of concern. Yeah. Have to be we can do that. The worst ones. Yeah. Or we you could just completely flip the script and embarrass me by using all of the PFF numbers I've never heard of and asking me to answer, in which case it'd be a lot worse show. There are, I do wish like there is a way to get more advanced with PFF. Like, or I, I just have, and I'm assuming you just have like the general account that like anybody walking the street can get for whatever it is, like 30 bucks a year or something like that. But they definitely they get way more in depth with their data, but it costs a lot of money to, <laughs> to get access to it. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I was going cross-eyed already. There's, yeah. there's too many numbers as it is. I, I, I can't even imagine what that would look like. We can or, get into some like rushing yards before contact. We can get into like receiver separation stuff. Like there's, there's a lot there. I did expect to see. It was like the there was a breakaway number for Travion that I thought was mm-hmm. too like it. It didn't compute with what I remember seeing with my eyes. He was kind of low in that. Yeah. I remember thinking that too, seeing that number. I don't know why. I guess like he had like that was like a two or three week stretch where like it was just like home run after home run after home run. And then I guess like in the Michigan game, he never really busted that big one um, that I was kind of waiting for. So maybe that's 
I mean, that's why I thought the number would be higher in my head, but it, it did seem low based off what we saw. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll tack that on to some other surprising numbers as we uh, continue on here on the podcast daily throughout the month of June. Just trying a little something new. Just trying to keep get on Bill Landis' level with these PFF numbers. That's right. Uh, let us know if that worked for you. We should do more because I, I know that Bill wants to. And <laughs> it, it was kind of fun for me to go on a scavenger hunt. Uh, but thanks for joining us for this edition. More coming throughout the week. Uh, Wednesday will be the start of camp season. So I'm sure, Burn will talk a little bit about that on the podcast daily tomorrow. We'll see you then. He's yeah. Bill. I'm Austin. So long.